What we're gonna talk about in this video is what I consider one of the, the most fascinating subjects in biology, and that's the variation we see from species to species in life histories and lifespans and their rate of reproduction. For example, we have three different species here. On, on the left, we have an African elephant. An African elephant, you might know, can live a, a, a long time, especially out in the wild. It could live many decades, even 40, 50, 60 years. And their life history actually parallels human, at least modern human life history in a lot of ways. The first 10 years of their life, they are very dependent on their parents. Uh, after that, they kind of enter into a bit of an adolescence, very similar to uh, how humans do, where in theory they could reproduce, uh, but they don't tend to, and they are still somewhat dependent. And then they move into a phase uh, uh, when they do reproduce, and they will reproduce uh, on the order of once every two to four, once every two to four years a female African elephant will reproduce. Their gestation period, the amount of time that the, the baby elephant will be in the mother's womb is on the order, it's actually longer than for humans. Humans, you probably know, is nine months. For an African elephant, it is 22 months. And so because of that, they can reproduce about once every two to four years. Now, another example, and these are actually uh, Af uh, elephants and, and rabbits might not look closely related to you, but they are actually still pretty closely related if you think about the entire tree of life. They are both mammals. And we're actually, all everything we're, we're considering here are animals. We're going to consider African elephant, rabbit, and we're going to consider salmon. But what I'm talking about applies to all life. It applies to bacteria. It applies to trees. That there's a huge variation in in, in their fecundity, the rate at which they reproduce. Let me write that word down. Fecundity, fecundity, the rate at which they reproduce, and also variation in their actual lifespan, whether you're talking about a tree, or a bacteria, or a fish, or a mammal. But just going from one mammal to another, let's go to a rabbit. And depending on, on which type of rabbit you're talking about, but a rabbit could, uh, lifespan is in the single digit years. But unlike an elephant, an elephant, the first 10, 15, 20 years of their life, they aren't in that reproductive phase of their life. Uh, a rabbit enters into that reproductive phase of their life within several months, within four or five months of birth. And so, and once they enter into that reproductive phase, and I, I'm showing the reproductive phase in magenta here, they can reproduce a lot. They have high fecundity. They have a very high reproductive rate. Every time a, a female rabbit has a litter, it can have, it can have many, many baby rabbits in it. The numbers I found were one to 14, one to 14, rabbits, and not only can they have one to 14 rabbits every time they have a litter, but they can have, a, they, can, they can do this on the order of once a month. So every, every month. So even though the lifespan of that female rabbit, depending on which type of rabbit you're talking about, might be, it might be uh, three, four, five, uh, six years, depending on the type of rabbit you're talking about, you can imagine if they're producing, let's say 10, uh, 10 rabbits every month per year, they could produce 120 rabbits, uh, or, or if they could produce 10 rabbits per month, 12 months a year, that's 120 rabbits a year over several years. And then you can imagine those rabbits very quickly, the female ones, the, the, if we assume roughly half of them are female, that half can very quickly get into that reproductive phase and then start reproducing at a similar rate. So on an individual level, a, a female rabbit has high fecundity, and then as a, on, a, on a population level, that group of rabbits would also have very, very high fecundity. And then we could look at another example. And this is the example of salmon, and there's many types of salmon. But the general way th that salmon, the, 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 the general life cycle that salmon go through is they are born, then, and they are usually born uh, up some stream and, and usually some water that is, that where there, there isn't a strong current. And then once the baby salmon are born, and they could be born in groups of, of hundreds or thousands, they make their way down that river, down that stream, into the ocean, and then they have many years of a growth phase in the ocean where they get larger and larger. They're not reproducing then, and then when they are ready to reproduce, they fight their way back up 
the same stream that they were born in or the same river that they were born in, they fight their way back up to it and they reproduce, and this is both the males and the females. The, the males fertilize, the, the, the females uh, produce the eggs, the males fertilize the eggs, and then they die. So they have one reproductive event. So you have one reproductive event and then death. And then they kill, they, they, they just die. And, and people are still understanding why exactly does this happen. So one reproductive event, reproductive event, and then, and then they die. And there's actually a, a technical term for species that do this. The salmon isn't the only one where they have that one, they go out with, you can kind of view it as a big bang, where they, they have that one reproductive event where they might have hundreds or even thousands of eggs, but then they die. This is called semilparity. Let me write this down. So this is called semil, semil parity. Semil comes from the Latin for once. Parity comes from the Latin for to beget. So to beget once. You're reproducing once, and then in the case, and then in the case of salmon, you are dying. And you might say, okay, if that's semil parity, what would we call an elephant or rabbits? Rabbits for sure, <laughs> and, and elephants as well. They can have multiple reproductive events. Well, there, that is called itero parity. Itero, itero parity. You might have heard the word iterate. That means to repeat something or to do something over and over again. Itero is the root for, it means repeat. So itero parity, beget repeatedly. And so that's what animals like uh, elephants and for sure rabbits are actually doing. And what's fascinating about all of this is, and this is a question that I've I've wondered many, uh, you know, since I first realized when I was young that wow, why why is there so much variation here? Is wh wh why has nature selected for, or why have these species found uh, niches in which they can operate, in which it makes sense, where natural selection has selected for these very different lifespans, these very different. Uh, reproduction rates, this variation in fecundity, this you know sometimes iteroparity, sometimes semilparity, and it is a bit of it's not a mystery. People are studying this and they have good hypotheses, but we don't know for sure, especially from species to species. And a framework you could use to think about it is is a a species they're trying to optimize survival. And not even of the individual. They're trying to optimize survival of really their genetic information. That's what, uh, and it's not like the species or the genes are actively trying to do it, but natural selection is, is, is doing that for them. So let's call this box natural selection. Natural selection. And so what you have coming out of this is the fittest, fittest genes. And when we talk about fittest genes, we're not talking about somehow that some are better than others. We're just saying for that environment, the ones that seem, the, 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 the genes that produce the traits uh, that are most suitable to survival and most suitable towards reproduction. And then the inputs that are going into this natural selection box are things like availability of energy, of, of food, of, well, I'll call it free energy. Availability, because it's not just, obviously plants can get that free energy from the sun. Availability, ability of energy. We could talk about the predatory environment. Predatory, predatory environment. We could talk about disease, disease. Every moment that an organism is alive, it has to worry about these things. It has to worry about finding food or competing for food. It has to worry about predators. It has to worry about disease. And once again, the individual organism is not sitting there. It's not necessary that these salmon are like, oh, I hope I don't catch a disease, or, or they might not even you know, be stressed about the bears that might try to grab them as they go upstream. But these are the factors that play into uh, how, how, or how, how, what gets selected for, I guess is, 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 is the best way to phrase it. And in terms of, from a species point of view, the various dials, well, these are things like reproduction. Like what, is it, what does a species decide to do given these constraints? And so the various di dials are fecundity, actually let me write it this, rate of reproduction, 
age of reproduction, when these are related, age of reproduction, things like lifespan, and these are also all related in some way. Lifespan, growth, growth, health. And a, a species and an organism ha is making trade-offs all of the time. Do we, do, you know, the salmon goes through that huge phase where it's deciding to apply most of its energy towards growth and survival. And then all of a sudden it kicks into another gear where it, it, it actually uses a lot of that energy that was stored up to go upstream and it goes into a reproductive phase and then it dies. And natural selection has, has this has happened arguably because that somehow uh, helps the salmon's DNA to spread more. Uh, uh, maybe somehow it, it adds nutrients to the water or you know, they put all of that energy to go upstream uh, so that their offspring will have an easier time going downstream. But there's also other trade-offs. You could have things that lay, a, a salmon might, a female salmon might lay thousands of eggs, but very few of those actually make it, make it through the full cycle. The estimates I've seen is out of those thousands of legs, eggs that get laid, uh, only about three make it back. This was the example I saw for sockeye salmon. On, on average, only three of them make it back for the next year. So you have a huge amount of, I guess you could say, attrition. While in the case of an elephant, they invest more per offspring and you have a much higher probability that each of those offspring will survive. So there's all sorts of interesting trade-offs to think about when you think about life history, uh, life cycle, lifespan, and things like fecundity and how organisms reproduce.